We go back on location in this episode of Star Trek for Friday's Child. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of trekking through compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Trekking Through Compliance, Episode 40, Friday's Child. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode Friday's Child, which aired on December 1, 1967, and occurred on Stardate 3497.2. Story synopsis. Kirk attempts to secure a mining agreement for Topoline on Capella 4. Coincidentally, Dr. McCoy had been stationed on the planet for two months and warns Kirk that although the Capellans are scrupulously honest, they are a warlike, seven-foot-tall, and extremely strong people. Their conventional weapon is a throwing star-type weapon called a Kleat. Before beaming down with McCoy, Spock, and a red-shirted security officer, and you know what that means, Kirk warns Scott, that the Klingons are thought to be active in the Capella 4 sector and to be a- alert for them. After beaming down, this prediction McCoy makes is borne out. As McCoy greets the Capellans, the landing party learns that the Klingons have arrived first and are presumably already engaged in negotiations with the Capellans. Before he can be restrained, Brad, the red-shirted security guards, pulls out a phaser to shoot the Klingon emissary and is instantly killed by a cleat-wielding capellan. After the landing party agrees to hand over its weapons and devices, as the Klingons have already done, they are treated as honored guests. A capellan woman offers Kirk some food, but Kirk is luckily restrained by McCoy before touching her, since it turns out that touching a capellan woman mandates hand-to-hand combat with her closest male relative. In fact, Kirk's refusal to initiate, initiate combat greatly disappoints the woman's closest male relative. Kirk and the Klingon negotiate with Tier Akar, or that's Akar, leader of the Ten Tribes of Capella. While the Tier seems to favor the Federation mob and Tier's consort favor the Klingons. The Tier is then challenged to a duel by Ma'ab, but before this can take place, a factional fight for power occurs. In the fighting, Aka'ar is killed and Ma'ab becomes the Tier. Upon becoming the Tier, Ma'ab's perspective changes, especially after seeing fear in the Klingon's eyes when Kirk challenges him to a fight. Meanwhile, a Klingon vessel diverts the Enterprise with a phony distress call from the freighter Diadra. To Scott's surprise, upon arriving at the scene of the distress call, he can find no trace of the distress ship. However, he notes that the distress distress call asked for the Enterprise by name, despite the fact that a freighter would not have knowledge of its whereabouts. As the Enterprise speeds back to Capella, the Klingons try another diversion with a distress call from the USS Caroline. Scott ignores it, saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. However, before the Enterprise can return to Capella, it is confronted by a Klingon warship. On Capella, Akaar's pregnant wife, Eileen, is sentenced to death because she carries a royal child. Kirk intervenes in the process, antagonizing the Capellans and Eileen herself, who demands <clears throat> his death for Kirk's laying hands upon her. The Enterprise landing party is put under guard with Eileen, and McCoy prepares to treat her wounded arm. The landing party takes the opportunity to overpower their guards and run away to save Eileen. They hide out in the hills where McCoy treats Eileen's arm and discovers that she may give birth at any time. She then becomes interested in McCoy. Using their communicators, Kirk and Spock set up an avalanche which blocks and kills some of the Capellans tracking them. The Klingons use this opportunity to steal one of the confiscated phasers from a wounded Capellan, then stabs him to death. Kirk then finds a cave in which to shelter Eileen, but the climb there is difficult. Eileen will only let McCoy help her climb up, remarking, and till McCoy remarks, I'm a doctor, not an escalator. In the cave, they make a fire using magnesium, magnesite, nitron tablets. While McCoy delivers the baby, Kirk and Spock construct bows and arrows. 
After giving birth, Eileen hits McCoy on the head with a rock and runs to give herself up to the compellents. She claims to have killed the child and the Earthmen as they slept. The Klingon does not believe her and demands the compellents, under threat of phaser fire, verify her story. Suddenly, Kirk shoots the Capellan with, excuse me, the Klingon with an arrow, and, and an exchange between the Capellan. Kirk and Spock follows. A Klingon threatens to shoot anyone who raises a weapon against him. This does no good as Ma'ab exchanges his life for that of Eileen by confronting the Klingon, and Kail uses the opportunity to kill the Klingon with a cleat. After the fracas has taken place, Scott and the landing party arrive when McCoy reunites with Eileen with her child and confounds Spock with the use of an obscure earth dialect, Uchi Wuchi Kuchi Ku. Kirk then gains the mining rights with Eileen as she acts as regent for the tier to be, naming the baby Leonard James Akaar. What's the fun fact for today? Well, the title comes from a very old and ancient rhyme, which tells what children will be like according to the day of the week they are born. So Monday's child is fair of face, Tuesday's child is full of grace, Wednesday's child is full of woe, Thursday's child has far to go, Friday's child is loving and giving, Saturday's child works hard for a living, is good and gay. This show brings up an interesting issue around the Prime Directive. All of the discussion around the Capellan seeming blasé about seeing people beaming in and out uh, really got me thinking about how they first found out about aliens. Later, the Prime Directive would be more clearly defined about not making contact with pre-warp societies before they're ready, but at this episode and at this point in the series, it seems rather undefined. Uh, Certainly, the seemingly primitive Organians were well aware of aliens, even to the point of disguising Spock as a Vulcan traitor. It's possible that if someone outside the Federation, such as the Kleons, had made contact with them, the damage might have been considered to have already been done, so they might have said, what the heck, let's just go and make the best of it. On the other hand, at this point, perhaps the Prime Directive might be overridden in matters of interstellar importance, such as a planet being threatened by Klingon invasion, or worse, for its resources, such as Sapella. Um, So, what does, or how does, how strictly should we, or the members of the Enterprise, interpret the Prime Directive? It's always a tricky thing. Uh, at some point, uh, Kirk seems to be um, not too concerned about following the Prime Directive. At other times, it's clearly very important. So what are your thoughts on the Prime Directive? So what are the compliance lessons learned from this episode? Well, I think the first one is really on leadership. CCC, remain cool, calm, and collected. Uh, Kirk really goes off the deep end when the red shirt is killed. And while that's probably not unacceptable behavior, as a leader, he still has to remain cool, calm, and collected to deal with the situation. But it really takes a different turn in the tent afterwards when Kirk goes after McCoy, who has presented him information which Kirk has either misinterpreted or has been overtaken by the events, specifically having the Klingon appear uh, when the landing party uh, dematerialized. Um, Second, training. Train your employees what to do when faced with a situation where they are uh, maybe uh, asked to pay a bribe or extorted. So what do you do? If Kirk had trained the red shirt what to do when the Klingon appeared, that perhaps he would not have been killed. And finally, number three, what's your responsibility when your leadership misinterprets the information that you have given him and then really go off the deep end because they have misapplied the facts to the situation on hand? That's the situation McCoy faced, and what do you do? Join us tomorrow for The Deadly Years. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. Thank <laughs> you.